Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. Today I'm looking at a book which came to us from Globe Lawn Business. Now, I saw this title some time ago. In fact, it's been around a while, this book, and I'm recording the review in 2023, but the book appeared last year in 2022. It's called The Art and Craft of Judgment Writing, a primer for common law judges. Now, I was fascinated by this because one of the greatest things I have found about the law is reading some of the really erudite, clear and concise judgments by the leading jurists of the time. And I go back quite a long way to obviously the 60s and I think of, of people like Lord Reed and Lord Denning and then I think of, of, of the excellent judges we have today. But of course this book is really giving some indication about how a judgment is actually drafted. And so I've given a title to this book. We all know which judges should read this book. Now that's not, <laughs> it's a bit tongue-in-cheek because the point about it is to say, well, most judges are excellent, and one or two could sharpen their practice up a bit. Now, this book will help. There's the book itself. You can see it's standard house style for globe. There's the side. And on the back, there are um, a large number of, of comments. And I, I have borrowed some of what's there for the review. Let's look at the back of the book. There's no index at the... Oh, there actually is an index. Sorry, I've got it wrong. There is an index for change at the back. And it's by page numbering. Normally we don't get too much, but what we do get here is we've got quite quite a large number of judges mentioned. All the usual suspects are here, I may hasten to add, so you can have a good look at them. I wasn't quite sure if there was an index, but there is on this occasion, and you can see there that the index is set out. Then there's quite a substantial selected bibliography at the back. Again, quite that's quite a large bibliography, um, which covers quite a lot of... Um, quite a lot of case, um, the actual uh, books written by or about judges. And then, then we got at the back of it the table of cases. It's done in reverse to some of the, um, some of the books that I reviewed. There is footnoting, as you can probably see at the bottom there. In fact, I'm going, we're working backwards. There's an appendix, the judgment as the art of truth. Well, we'd all like it to be like that, I'm sure. But th this book is not a long book, though. it's 300 pages, and it's actually quite easy to read. If I go to the front of the book, let's go to the front again, if I can get to the first page. Uh, there we go, you can see, there it is, there's the first page there, as usual. Then you've got um, the, the blurb about the book. Then you've got the table of contents, and you can see how it's structured. What you've got is... A forward by Mr. Justice Max Barrett. You've got the theory and the art and craft of judgment writing, part one. Part two, the practice of art and craft of judgment writing. And it mentions specific judges across the board, some of whom I've met. Um, mentioned Scalia uh, in America, Justice Scalia, and of course Lord Denning, who I uh, met on many occasions. Then part three is um, extemporal judgments. Then part the, the appendix then is the judgment as the art of truth, which I referred to, which gives you some indication of what it is. And of course, Denning gets quite a lot of substantial mention at the beginning. Then you've got a preface by Sir Robin Jacob, who will be well known to many of you, uh, who's now at the University College of London. You can see again the uh, footnoting. I don't want to spoil this book because actually um, this book is really uh, a treasure if you, if you read it. Then you've got Mr Justice Barrett setting out uh, why he's written the book and, and how the book actually evolved um, and he, de he dedicates it. The dedication is actually there and I'll just leave you to read that just for a minute. We only review books we like. I don't review books I don't like. And then what we've got is on judgments and then and then he talks about what the chapter's about and he runs it through. What I liked about this book is the conversational style in which it's written, apart from anything else, which made it a lot easier to read. Um, and in fact, I found it um, fascinating, of course, because it's dealing not just with judgments, it's, being, it's dealing with the history, more modern history, actually, from my point of view, um, of, of some of the leading uh, judges and, and the way they've delivered their judgments. So what do I say about the book? Well, I say this. As I say, we all know which judges should read the book. And so the title is The Art and Craft of Judgment Writing. 
uh, been written by a judge, Max Barrett, and all the usual suspects are present in the book, including my favourites, Lords Denning and Reed. If you've ever wondered how judgments materialise, this is the book for you. And as an interesting note, the book came in at a time when I was just waiting for a judgment and I had to go back to the Royal Courts of Justice for a judgment. Uh, which was delivered by <clears throat> the judge and I was thinking how I wondered how she was actually going to whether she'd read the book and whether how she was actually going to produce the judgment in the end it was although there was quite a lot of legal argument um, in the end it was very much um, because it was an oral judgment very much um, um, picking on the bits and the factual issues concerning the case so there wasn't too much law in it However, what, what we do say and what the book says uh, here is that judges are increasingly aware that the best way of enhancing public confidence in court systems is not only by providing a quality service, but doing so compassionately and respectfully. And of course, we've had recent guidance from the, um, the um, Ministry of Justice on that and the Lord Chief Justice <coughs> about behaviour in court. So the art and craft of judgment writing is a critical element of uh, this approach uh, and the process itself. Because what the book does is it looks at judgments of the historically great judgment writers from the United States of America, uh, the UK and the wider common, um, common law world of countries. That includes, of course, Australia, Canada, India, Ireland, Israel and New Zealand. And I think that's helpful because there is an international aspect to it. And it's written not just from the, pros, um, from the perspective of what the author can teach, but with the aim of identifying essential elements of good judgment writing in great judgments and insightful commentary. Now, that insightful commentary, I think, is quite helpful because that gives you some indication with the commentary about the way in which one would be reviewing the presentation of a case if you're an advocate. And I do think that's quite helpful. Now, the author is uh, Dr Max Barrett, who's a judge of the High Court of Ireland. Uh, the individual chapters that he's created focus on subjects such as the following. Judgment purpose, length, style and structure, concurring and dissenting judgments, judgment writing for children and vulnerable parties, important area of law for me in the family division, as well as more general lessons in good writing, which are offered from great authors from uh, Orwell to Mark Twain. Amongst the lessons to be taken from the great common law uh, judges, says the book, are the following, and this is the list, and I think it's quite helpful. A good judgment possesses an ability to rise above immediate facts and to see a problem in its wider perspective. Secondly, a sense of empathy or sympathy for those faring badly is always important. That does come through today, I think, in quite a lot of judgments. Even if the judgment goes against you, the judge is always balancing everything out. And certainly that is what I'm seeing at the moment in, in the judgments that I have um, obviously delivered after I've done a, um, a trial. And finally, uh, in this section, there's nothing wrong with language that is occasionally flowery and ornate. However, the best judgments are crisp and persuasive. Now, that's quite interesting because Denning used to do that quite a lot. <laughs> a bit of uh, flowery and ornate stuff. I'm not going to mention the um, cases, but uh, there are one or two very amusing um, <clears throat> statements that he makes at the beginning of a judgment to set the scene of what the, the actual case is about. And he does it very succinctly. And a lot of judges do that now. Now, a great author such as Mark Twain teaches, for example, that every element of a judgment should be necessary to that judgment. And any unnecessary elements excised, quite right. In other words, you want to go straight and focus to what you're dealing with. Any per uh, person or event included in a judgment should be included for a reason. Now, obviously, in in the view of many of the judgments we have, where there's been a trial, you're looking at the evidence <coughs> that has actually been adduced. So you're looking at the people who've been in the witness box, uh, examination in chief, cross-examination and re-examination. So <coughs> obviously there's a reason and they, they have to be, that their evidence has to be reviewed. Of course, a judge should always use the right word 
for what she wants to state, not its second cousin. <coughs> Excuse me. In other words, you've got, you've got to use the right English. And of course, in this day and age, in 2023, you've got to be aware of the sensitivities of the situation, because clearly in the past, some of the judgments have, 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 have actually not been what we would say a model of um, the way we should do things today. Let me put it like that. Now, the publishers, Globe Law, consider that the book is, quote, intended for novice superior court judges, their more seasoned colleagues, and all with an interest in legal writing, including legal practitioners, law teachers and law students. And that, that in, obviously includes me, because I found this book to be very interesting, um, as looking, looking at it from the point of view about how a judgment is created. I fortunately never had to uh, write a judgment, because I've never been a judge. Uh, although I've obviously been a uh, member of planning committee and chaired planning committees, so I've, I've looked at it in a quasi-judicial sense, but never, never as a judge. So I found it very helpful. And of course, I believe that lower court judges also, um, who are required to write judgments, this would be the county court, um, should find the, the book, I think, very valuable for what it suggests. And of course, judges at all levels should find the additional chapter on extemporal judgments I think of great use, uh, which of course is the uh, towards the end of the book. Now the hardback edition appeared on the 15th of May 2022 from Globe, and it's a little bit, it's nearly a year later than I've looked at it, but I'm doing it now. There's the book again, and I'm delighted to do so. If I open it in the middle, um, <clears throat> here we go, we've got quite a nice mention here of a uh, number of cases. <clears throat> it, it talks here about three great judges, Lord, Lords Aitken, Denning and Bingham. Now they are probably the great judges and what we've got here is I'm looking at Denning in particular and some of his judgment uh, judgments uh, really quite interesting uh, judgments that they've picked all the way through. Now uh, Bezik and Bezik will be known to many of you and a few of the other cases <coughs> but, but what I do say is that you will find for instance there's a um, one of the um, great judgments by Lord Denning was uh, the High Trees case. That's Central London Property Trust Limited and High Trees House Limited. And also the dissenting judgment in Candler and Crane Christmas and Co. Um, again, these are important cases and they're nicely covered 